Three politicians died in an automobile accident on Easter Sunday, and as they lined up at the pearly gates of heaven, St. Peter told them that they could enter the gates if they were able to answer one simple question. Peter approached the nearest politician, Governor, what is Easter? And the governor replied, oh, that's easy, it's the holiday in November when everyone gets together and eats turkey and is thankful. Wrong, replied St. Peter, and proceeded to the next in line and asked the same question. Congressman, what is Easter? And the representative replied, Easter is the holiday in December when we, we put up a nice tree and exchange presents and celebrate the birth of Jesus. St. Peter looked at the congressman in disbelief, shook his head, and told him he was wrong. Peter came to the last in line. Senator, what is Easter? The senator smiled confidently. Look, St. Peter right in the eyes and said, I know what Easter is. Oh, really? What is it? Easter is the Christian holiday that coincides with Jewish Passover. Jesus and his disciples had the Last Supper, and Jesus was later deceived and turned over to the Romans, who took him, tried him, and crucified him. He was buried in a tomb sealed with a large boulder. And St. Peter smiled broadly with delight. And the senator, smug and proud of St. Peter's response, added, and then every year the boulder is moved aside so that Jesus can come out, and if he sees his shadow, there will be six more weeks of life. <laughs> This morning, I want to ask and to suggest an answer to the question, what is Easter? We come on Easter morning singing happy tunes and rejoicing because we know the real end of the story. The boulder has been moved and Christ is risen. Jesus lives. But as we heard in the reading at the start of the story, that first Easter, the disciples were not so sure about what had happened. Mary, alone in her grief in the dark of the morning, arrives at the tomb only to discover that it's been open. Perhaps fearing she'd encounter rogue grave robbers in the dark, she rushed to Peter and another male disciple with the news that they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Mary at this point thinks that they involved were, were opponents of the Jesus movement. And Peter and the other male disciple do the macho thing. This is meant to be a comical retelling, actually. They literally race each other to the grave. And while Peter loses the race, the other disciple peeks into the tomb, but doesn't enter he waits for Peter to go first. Perhaps he too fears he might encounter the grave robbers alone in the dark. And once Peter arrives, they both go in and they confirm that the body is gone. And they find the linen that covered Jesus. We are told that the cloth that had been on Jesus' head was not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. And this matters because if the they who had taken the bodies were humans, they would have left the body wrapped and certainly not rolled anything up. Wrapping's presence is evidence that Jesus' body was gone, but not likely stolen. Nor did Jesus walk away like Lazarus, who, if you remember, was raised from the dead by Jesus. He was reanimated and walked out of the tomb in his burial Linens. In contrast, Jesus' burial linens are left behind in the tomb. They're still there. Jesus' body being carried away by humans is not evidenced in the tomb. What's evidenced, but the disciples don't understand yet, is that Jesus has conquered death. His body is not stolen, and it is not reanimated to finish out the rest of his life. Like Lazarus, yet still. Jesus' body is gone. And the two male disciples, seeing the tomb is empty, leave. And then they, they go home. Apparently they think there's nothing more that they can do in the garden. There's no stopping the grave from being empty by rogue robbers. They believe there's no longer a reason to linger. Jesus of Nazareth's body is gone. And the meaning of Easter to these two men early that morn was that Jesus' body was not in the tomb, only the wrappings remain. They don't get more than that in the dark, the dark of that morning. And Mary
Mary's outside the tomb weeping. Why does she weep? Jesus of Nazareth, her beloved rabbi, has been brutally killed. And now it appears the one last bit of him, his body, has been taken away. After the men leave, Mary does finally peek into the tomb. We're told that as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And this is, this is really interesting. The image of two angels and at the head and at the feet where the physical body of Jesus once was conjures up images of the Ark of the Covenant. Angels such as these were at the head and the foot and the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, that sacred vessel that once contained the original Ten Commandments. Angels are God's representatives on earth. And angels are in the tomb, but they didn't appear to the male disciples who raced and saw and left. Instead, the angels speak to Mary, the female disciple who came and told the others, brought the others, and stayed weeping in grief. And the angels, God's emissaries and therefore God's representatives, have concern for Mary in her grief. They, they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And up to this point, Mary has stated her concerns about the body missing as being all of the followers' concerns. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him, she'd been saying to the others. But now, when God asks her personally, her response is very personal. She says, they have taken my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And it's at this very moment, at that very moment, at the expression of very personal grief at the loss of Jesus of Nazareth, her, her rabbi and her friend, and Christ appears to her in the garden. Her tears metaphorically water something in the garden that blossoms into the very experience of Christ on earth. And Christ, who appeared in the, the first truly Easter moment, comes to Mary no longer in the missing body that she's been worrying about, but, but in something else altogether. We're told that she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Mary's tears watered something in that garden. Something in that garden that flowers into an encounter with Jesus in a stranger she thought was the gardener. And before this very moment, Jesus' work as Christ, God incarnate, was limited to experiences of Christ in Jesus' earthly body that, that was recognizable only as the one that he had while alive, as Jesus of Nazareth. But at that very moment, on the first Easter morning, Christ is experienced in the care of one who is grieving. It's a beautiful image that we can understand as Jesus bodily resurrection, but also as well as a poetic metaphor for how Christ lives in each of us, each of us, who care for the grieving tears of water cause love to blossom through Christ in another, a stranger, a very first Easter morn. It's as if to say Christ, God incarnate, is there through all who tend to those in sorrow. And this is a beatitude from Matthew 5. Come to life. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is Matthew 25. Come to life. Christ tends to the least. A grieving woman. Graveside. Marvelous acts of love that Jesus Christ did, can, and do go on in our Loving acts. We, all of us, can be loved. We can be loved through the resurrected Christ on earth now. See, see, one way or another, Christ 
lives. Christ lives. That's what Easter is about. Mary is just finding this out. She says in the tear-watered garden to the compassionate Christ in the stranger that she still wants the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. It's only when Christ calls her personally by name that she knows he lives. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni. Mary has one more lesson to learn. Like I said, she's still trying to hold on to the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth, but Christ is together something else from Easter onward. He's no longer trapped in the physical body of Jesus. Jesus is soon to be understood as the forever alive Christ by Mary and all of Christians who have ever lived since. But first, Mary and all the followers of Jesus have to let go of the physical Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And when Mary no longer only looks back to the body of Christ in one man, in Jesus of Nazareth, but looks to the forever here spiritual body of Christ, then Mary's growth from tears of grief to tears of relief to tears of belief is complete. She becomes the first apostle, one who has seen the risen Christ. And she runs off to start a whole new way of following Jesus, experiencing him in a post-Easter way, risen from death, no longer in that tomb. Christ's body wasn't taken by humans as Mary and the other disciples first imagined. For, for sure, Jesus the Christ from Nazareth's life was taken by an empire bent on hate and oppression, but Christ's life was given back by God in the form of compassion and love. And it is, in, it is telling that in Mary's story, that life returned for one who is grieving, crying, one who is very much in need. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said things to her. And it turns out that others then go on to experience Christ in times of need and in tears, too. But it's only the beginning. In grief, the disciple weeps in the garden, and on Easter, Christ appears to comfort her. And Christ, though, appears again and again on Easter. In fear, the disciples gather in a locked room, and on Easter, Christ appears to bring them peace. In doubt, Thomas questions. On Easter, Christ appears and belies their doubt. Hungry, the disciples fish, and on Easter, Christ appears and feeds them. Spiritually questioning, two weary disciples wander the road to Emmaus, and on Easter, Christ appears and teaches and rests and breaks bread with them. And on the very first Easter morning, Christ is experienced, tending those in need. On the very first Easter morn, Jesus' teaching and love and presence lives on. Nonviolent, love wandering peace nicknamed Jesus is vindicated by God. Jesus' way, God's way of peace and love could not be extinguished by an empire bent on hate and injustice. The cross could not kill Jesus, did not kill Jesus. He lives. Love won. Love wins. As a consequence on each month of the world celebrates the fact that love wins. That's what Easter is about. Love winning. And think about it. It has cosmic implications beyond right triumphing on a day in a garden 2,000 years ago. It has cosmic implications beyond the needs of the God apostles being met. It means that love cannot be stopped. Love cannot be stopped. Hate can try and hold love back, but it seeps like a wave through a sandcastle wall. Its waves flow over and through and on and on, never, ever stopping. The Easter message that love wins means there is real hope that the Christmas message of peace on earth, goodwill to men can happen. That it will happen. That's the great hope Christians have faith in and celebrate and rejoice 
That's what Easter is. It's what Easter is about. God is love. Christ is God. Incarnate on earth. Love lives. Christ lives. In a stranger in the garden, with friends who are in doubt, in a stranger on the road, in a stranger at the beach, in all who tend to the least of us. In you, in me, in all of us, in all the hues of love, to wipe away tears and provide care. In Easter, that, my friends, is the awesomest good news ever. Rejoice, for Christ lives. Amen.